Greetings everyone and welcome back to 365 Days of Prague. Today we're gonna be reviewing The Brothers Club by Hatfield and the North. Hi, my name's Naomi. I'm an avid progressive rock fan, but I'm a long ways from knowing all the Prague albums out there. But this year, I'm gonna give it a try. This is 365 Days of Prague. Hatfield and North, oh my god, it has taken us some time, but we're finally there. It's a name that I've heard multiple times, not in the recent year, but in the recent many years, basically since I started listening to Prague, seeing as I got into some of the Canterbury scene quite early on, and this is one of those names that have been floating around quite a lot, and I do not know their debut album quite yet, so this is also something to note, so this is my first introduction with the band. Anyway, here's some of my favorite bits from this album. <laughs> So Hatfield and the North could probably be considered as the second most popular band that came out of the Canterbury scene, right after of course only Caravan. The two bands share a very similar tone and sound to one another and it doesn't really act as any surprise seeing as they are both spearheaded by no other than Richard Sinclair. And the funny thing is, now that I've listened to this album I can definitely say that if you're new to the entire Canterbury scene type of thing, the best way of getting into it, at least in my opinion, would be to start off with Caravan with an album like In the Land of Green Pink and then moving on and listening to Hatfield and North and only from there on you can actually branch out. But of course Dummy didn't do any of that and I got into the Canterbury scene in the most tumultuous way, started listening to Egg, started listening to Robert Wyatt, started listening to Kevin Ayers and you know whatever. And of course today at long last I am finally visiting this 1975 album by Hatfield and the North called the Rotters Club, and this one, well, I've been waiting for it for a while now, but the real question has to be asked, who are Hatfield and the North, and what makes them pop out a bit more than the rest of their Canterbury counterparts? Now excuse me for this, because I feel like I got some information wrong on here, I just kind of really tried comparing different sources and just putting them all together in a way that seems logical, but if I'm getting some inconsistencies, of course you can note them down in the comments and I'll make sure to correct them. So today's band actually started off from a different band that was formed by Steve Miller all the way back in 1966, and that band would be called Delivery. Now Delivery would be playing for a while, a lot of its members did come and go, seeing as they joined other Canterbury acts, and at finally in 1972 the band would receive a record contract from Virgin Records, which they would take, but instead of continuing on as Delivery, they would actually rebrand themselves as Hatfield and the North, and Delivery just kept on being but kind of didn't really do a lot. The band Delivery did have like one reunion I think around 1972 on the BBC sessions where they actually performed as a six man group with both Phil and Steve Miller as well as Lal Coxhill and Rob Baddington as well as Richard Sinclair and Pip Pyle. But after that as I said most members either left to work on different projects that they had or the rest of the members just joined together and created Hatfield and the North. 
And in 1947, the band came out with their debut album, which was a very promising album and quite a successful one at that, which was of course eponymous, being also called Hatfield and the North, and the band then followed it up in the next year with yet another seminal album, which is the one we're reviewing today, called The Rotters Club. Anyway, most of you probably know this, but one of the reasons which I actually started this series is because I wanted to get to know the prog world better, and when I say that, I don't just mean the prog albums. I actually want to get to know the community, the people that surround it, the people that create the music, the people that like the music, like you guys. And well, I feel like I've actually done a pretty good job with that this year, seeing as I've seen all the credits for this entire album, the contributors for it, and well, I actually recognized all of the names from different projects we've already reviewed this year. So to name all of the people that took part in this entire album, we have to mention them one by one. So Phil Miller is, we know him of course from Matching Mole, and Mont Campbell and Dave Stewart from Egg, Richard Sinclair is from Robert Wyatt's Rock Bottom, and Pip Pile is from Khan, Lindsay Cooper is actually from Comus and Jimmy Hastings from Caravan, Tim Hodgkinson from Henry Cow, Amanda Parsons and Anne Rosenthal are actually from Clear Lights Forever Blowing Bubbles, and Barbara Gaskin is actually from Spirogera. And this act of learning and actually getting to know these names and what uniqueness they add to each project they appear on is just a thing that I wholly love. I see all these people mentioning, you know, this one, he was a part of this project back in the 70s and now he's doing that and, you know, a lot of people knowing a lot of people and what they add to their sound and, well, I love the fact that I can actually start recognizing names and know to point them out when I hear them on an album. Anyway, The Rotters Club is just a great place to go to after you had your first crush on caravans in the land of grey and pink, and honestly the two albums they are quite similar in many ways, although I would have to mention that The Rotters Club seems to be a bit more down to earth in a way and not as nonsensical as caravans music, but in a way it is also very much quirky and of course course very witty. And there is no better place to see on this album the wittiness and the smartness of the lyrics themselves than the first track called Share It. This one is a funny tune, it just criticizes everything about how we act and society and stuff like that, and it also tells you at the same time to, you know, not take it as an offense, we're just, you know, going about saying these things, but you know, don't mind us, it's just how things are. And this is also one of those first songs I think I've ever heard that actually used the word cringe in the same way that us Zoomers today use it, in a way that, oh, this is so cringy and stuff like that, so that's also interesting interesting to note. And of course this song is capped off with just the very high spirits of this entire band. They're going at it and of course we have a signature Dave Stewart mini Moog solo because how could we not? And this song would be crowned as my favorite from this entire album but don't fool yourself seeing as what's to come is actually almost equally good if not even better of course in a very subjective manner. We then move on to yet another track called Lounging There Trying and this one it's one of the first few instrumental pieces on this album and I think that it's a lovely one. It does take the spotlight to a place where it actually shines on the entire cast of this band in a sense which they actually do this sort of build up. It starts off with a very unique guitar solo which is then added on with a bass and then the keys and then the drums. And then we move on to a song called Big John Wayne's Sock Psychology on the Jaw. Now as much as I like this one as an individual track and the one after that and the one after that, I I would actually view this one up until the seventh track as just one long 19 minute continuous suite. And honestly this entire multi-track progression of songs is so damn good and if it would have been considered as one song as a whole divided into segments I would have called this one my favorite from the album. And of course the reason I'm even referring to this one as like feeling as if it's one song is because it has such seamless transitions between one another and all of the songs that make it up actually act as sort of counterparts to one another in a way that they balance each one 
out and you can't really listen to anyone individually and get the full scope of it without listening to the other. But if I had to choose one favorite from these ones, I would have to say that it would be the Yes No Interlude. This one is a semi-improvisational instrumental track of about 7 minutes which takes you right into the depths of whatever Canterbury means, and I don't know how to define that, you're just gonna have to listen to it yourself. And after this long sort of wait and build up and gratifications, whatnot, you then get to the next song which is of course very vocally driven called Fitter Stroke Has a Bath, which is of course yet another nonsensical Canterbury name. Now this unofficial suite from the album is followed by an individual track called Underdub, which is a nice little track, honestly not that memorable in a way, but it acts as this sort of spacer between the first suite and the second suite on the album, which is actually considered to be one song called Mumps. Now Mumps is what I personally would consider as like the brighter, more modest version of Nine Feet Underground by Caravan, or maybe it's younger sister person say. Honestly, if you like the first one, you're gonna like the second. They're very much interchangeable in a way. This one is more mild in a way. It doesn't really change moods that often, but it's still very much great. It features a lot of instrumental sections, very rich with vocals, but not entirely singing as a whole, at least not in the first part. And honestly, I like that quite a bit, and it definitely did cement the idea that Hatfield and the North are the natural progression when you're just coming off of Caravan heels. And with that I can just sit here for myself and wonder to myself what might their eponymous album from 1974 sound like and unfortunately I was pretty sure that it was on the list this year but apparently it isn't. Nobody recommended it, I don't know how, so I'll only have to get to it by 2023 which is definitely a big shame. So looking for information about this cover, I didn't really find a lot, so what I did find is quite scarce, but here's what I got. So this album cover was made by Laurie Lewis. Of course, it is a photograph, but I couldn't find who the model is, and I couldn't find what the image she's signing on is, and I couldn't find any meaning for this one, at least not online, and I wouldn't really place myself in the position of actually finding the right meaning for this, so I don't know. But it was made by no other than Laurie Lewis, who's actually known the band through Pip Pile. The two of them have worked in the past when Lewis was creating short films, and Pile would write scores for them. And Lewis was actually also in charge for creating the cover for the band's debut album featuring the Reykjavikian Horizon line, but this one is entirely different. And in a way, it doesn't quite look like what you might expect from a Canterbury album cover, but in a sense, it also redefines what Canterbury album covers should and could look like. And just as some bit of extra information that doesn't really regard anything, did you know that this album inspired the name for a 2000 2001 book by the same name of The Rotters Club, which talks about a boy growing up in the 70s and a bit of progressive rock, and it's very interesting, but that book is most noteworthy for having what is considered by many the longest sentence in English literature that is known, containing a whopping amount of 13,995 consecutive words in one sentence. So for now, this album will receive a very noteworthy rating of 8 out of 10, but I still think to myself that it's a very good album, and maybe even deserves more, but that's what I'm gonna give it right now. Anyway, that is about it guys, I hope that you enjoyed this video, and stay tuned for tomorrow because we're gonna be reviewing Strangers by Scardust. I of course wanna thank my lovely supporters over on Patreon, so thank you so much to Clay Wall and Rist of Kings and Lindsay Haycox, you guys are just the best, and if any of you wanna support me over over on Patreon, you can find the link down in the description or in my about page. But that's about it guys, have a wonderful day and I'll catch you all tomorrow. Bye guys.